it's only owing to the perspicacity of my literary agent that I still own both my t-shirt rights and my action figure rights. <laughs> I always think of those. You mentioned that, Debbie, and I thought if people just do not realize the cluster uh -huh. of, um, of, of stuff that accrues around a successful Oh, book. that's right. Yeah, no, nobody thinks of this. And uh, many people, in fact, uh, sign away all their rights for essentially nothing because they don't even realize those rights exist. Right. So yeah, a literary agent is uh, a good one. <laughs> is it worth his or her weight in gold? Very true. So you've got an agent. Yeah, well, essentially I said, how would I find an agent? And they said, well, uh, there's different ways. There's books, then there's organizations who keep lists and so forth. They said, but you know a lot of published authors who have agents. Why don't you just talk to them? I said, fine. <laughs> so I began asking questions. Since I was nowhere near finished with the book, I just asked a published author whenever I was talking to them about anything. I said, oh, could you tell me, do you have an agent? And if so, where did you meet them? How does it all work? And so on. And they were help very helpful about sharing information. And so I gradually began to zero in on this one man who I had heard a number of good things about named Perry Knowlton, but I wasn't sure how to approach him because I had heard that he didn't take unsolicited uh, queries. And uh, so I said, well, I'm not anywhere near finished with the book, so I can wait. Maybe I'll find another agent. Maybe I'll figure out how to approach him. So I just went on. And a few months later, I was talking to John Stiff, who writes science fiction mysteries, and I asked him about agents. And he said, oh, yes. He said, by coincidence, mine is the same as so-and-so's. It's Perry Knowlton. He said, I know you're almost ready to look for an agent. Would you like me to write you a letter of recommendation? <laughs> and I said, well, that would be really nice of you, John. <laughs> so he did, and I followed that with my own query, in which I said, uh, dear Mr. Knowlton, I've been writing and selling nonfiction by myself for the last 15 years, but now that I'm writing a novel, I understand I would really benefit from literary representation and all these people whose opinions I respect have referred me to you. I said, I have this uh, very long historical novel. Would you be willing to read excerpts from it? I didn't tell him I wasn't finished writing it. Excerpts were all I had. And so he called back and said he would. So I sent him a synopsis and my excerpts, and he took me on on the basis of an unfinished first novel, which is not usual. <laughs> no, it's not, but of course it helps that you had delivered nonfiction. Yeah, so I mean, I could actually finish a book. <laughs> right, and that, that's uh -huh. sort of the crux of the yeah. matter, really, uh -huh. yeah. is, you know, <laughs> can you get from the proposal uh -huh. to the book? That's right. Uh, uh -huh. So he took you on and uh -huh. sold the book, and Outlander, now it's called Outlander here mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. England, as I remember it was published to the title Cross Stitch. Cross Stitch, that's right. What does Outlander mean? Uh, well, Outlander is basically a foreigner, you know, someone from beyond the borders of, uh, you know, a tightly held home place. Uh, my working title for the book was Cross Stitch, which was sort of a feeble play on a stitch in time and, you know, the time travel crossing back and forth and a few other minor references. It's not a terribly good title, but it's what I was using as a working title. When uh, Perry sold the book to uh, uh, the American publisher, though, they said, well, you know, this sounds too much like embroidery. <laughs> Can you think of something more adventurous? And so we thought and thought and thought, and after months of exchanging lists of, you know, ever more ludicrous suggestions, I finally, come up, fi finally came up with Outlander. And uh, they said, great, this will work fine. What they actually said was, oh, it's only one word. Good, it won't cover up the art. <laughs> well, yeah, e economy in book titles is a really good thing. Yeah. Um, I noticed that the concordance to this series, which um, we published, was it two years ago? Yeah. Mm -hmm. came out. It was called The Outlandish Companion. That's right. So there was kind of a, a play on things there. Uh -huh. But also, is, if I remember, Jamie's term for Clary calls her Sassanach. Yeah, he calls her Sassanach, which is the Gaelic term meaning outlander. And the Highland Scots traditionally, and even up to today, have used that primarily to designate English people whom they have uh, historically seen as, you know, invaders and, uh, and uh, you know, generally intrusive influences. It's a very derogatory term, in fact, in general usage. Uh, and that's how he begins using it. But uh, she, of course, doesn't understand this, being an English person. And uh, over the course of the first book, he begins to use it as a term of endearment for her. And that's how it's continued. In fact, most of the people who have started reading somewhere other than the very beginning, and many who have and have forgotten, uh, don't realize what it means. <laughs> well, I, I was noticing, I was reading Fiery Cross, that mm -hmm. you know he refers to her by this mm -hmm. kind of, as you say, term of endearment or pet name as Sassanach. Mm -hmm. um, and since I am one, and uh -huh. I am aware that it is a <laughs> pejorative term yes. for people who are Scottish, um, uh, you know, who are Scots, sorry, that's mm -hmm. another thing that's easy to go wrong. It is not Scottish. If you're a person, you're a Scot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was aware, uh, and I wondered if there was a, you know, a, a, a double play here in your title, and clearly in, there is, uh -huh. you know, yes, in is. various uh -huh. ways. So you published that one in 1991, mm -hmm. and then we moved on to your second book, Dragonfly and Amber, but that yes. one came out really just a year later. Yes, well that's because, it's not that I was much faster writing it, it's that uh, the publisher sat on the first one for nearly 18 months trying to make up their minds how to publish it. Ah, so you had time and to so I was writing on the second book because they did give me a three-book contract. 
right. as I said to Perry, I said, there's more to this story, but I thought I should stop while I could still lift it. So you know, if anyone's interested, tell them there's more. And he did. And they said, well, trilogies are popular now. Could she write three? I know. You're into yeah. the fifth book of your trilogy well, with at least one or two to come. Well, I never I, said it was a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You and I have laughed at that over time. In fact, someone asked me the other night at a workshop for Peter Robinson, mm -hmm. um, or asked Peter, rather, you know, how do you know when a book is done? And we were discussing it, and I volunteered. You weren't there. I, I said, <laughs> well, I do know that Diana, her, her method for figuring out when she's ready to publish is when she can no longer lift it. <laughs> and I said, it's a good thing because I can't lift them either. Um, they, um, the story really is just one story. Unlike mysteries, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. every book is discrete in mm -hmm. the sense that it is a completely individual plot. Mm -hmm. You know, in a mystery novel, you may have um, characters whose stories mm -hmm. transpose to the next book, mm -hmm. but, but the mm -hmm. plot is over with. Mm -hmm. But in your books, uh, there are all kinds of plots, as you point out, uh -huh. worked in and mm -hmm. scenes, and they're complete in and of themselves, yes. but nevertheless, mm -hmm. they really are mm -hmm. all together, five-part story with, yes, with more right. to come. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the thing that makes them all work is the lives of Jamie Frazier mm -hmm. and Claire Beecham. That's right. Uh -huh. Do you intend this to stop when their lives are over? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Elizabeth it's, it's Peters, their story. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, exactly. Elizabeth Peters has said this about mm -hmm. her wonderful characters, uh, yeah. Amelia Peabody. Mm -hmm. And um, and her husband that mm -hmm. it is really their books. Yes. And, mm -hmm. You know when we get to the end. That's it. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so you know fortunately uh -huh. they're not very old yet so <laughs> <laughs> in your books so, so we have a way to go. Well anyway, Dragonfly came in ninety two mm -hmm. and then um, the uh, the Voyager yes. came uh -huh. in nineteen ninety three is ninety four four mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. again as a result of. Uh, of this original three book this contract. Original yes. thing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then we went all the way to 1997 mm -hmm. for Drums of Autumn. Right. Uh -huh. And now it's been four years, uh -huh. although the Outlandish Companion came on. So is it, is the, uh, the slowdown been because the story keeps growing? Um, uh, well, in part, the story, as uh, you can see from the books, is getting longer and more complex, both because uh, the characters are getting older, they're leading more complex lives, they're also moving with the tide of history, which through the 18th century was getting more and more complex the closer you got to the American Revolution, and we're also involving uh, some of the younger characters in a more major way. That is, the, the children of the original couple are now uh, young adults and of an age to be you know, seriously involved in the main plot lines, which of course causes additional complexities. The other, another aspect of this is just the engineering, which you mentioned in a way. That is, I could not be sure that people would encounter these as a series or even realize that they were a series. So each book is engineered to stand on its own and can be read as an independent novel. I mean, it's better if they start at the beginning and can sure. encounter them because they do uh, interweave with each other, but they are all meant to be uh, separate books. And I've never wanted to be one of those authors who essentially repeats the same structure of a book over and over again, though in fact this is one of the better ways of becoming a rich and famous author mm -hmm. is to do that. But uh, I never did write to be rich and famous, so I, I wrote more for the challenge. And so each of the books is structured in a completely different way and uses uh, different literary devices and approaches to do that. And this, of course, takes time. But perhaps the most important reason for the delay between books is uh, that I inadvertently did get to you know, at least a little bit more famous, if not totally rich yet. And uh, once, a, once you become at all popular, people start wanting you to go places and talk about your books, which means that while no one was at all interested in hearing me come and talk about Outlander when it first came out, for Fiery Cross, um, I probably get enough invitations that I could be gone two thirds of every month, you know, <laughs> not even just weekends of it all the time. Sure. So, you know, you have to pick and choose and say no to a lot, but you still end up spending quite a lot of your time on the road or, you know, writing essays or introductions for other people's books or giving cover quotes. There's, um, I call it the third life. So everybody's got their first life. That's your, your family and, you know, your, uh, your home and your hobbies, your religion, whatever you actually do during the day. Everybody's got that kind of life. Then if you're going to be a writer, you have to grow this whole second life, which is your interior solitary life, where it's just you and, and the book and the people in it. And a lot of people have trouble attaining a balance between these two lives. I know a lot of published authors who are divorced because they couldn't stay enough in the first life. They went too far that way. And I know a lot of people who have been writing their first novel for 10 years because they can't get far enough into the second world. So you, uh, if you're a successful writer, you balance these two lives. Then if you become really successful, you get published and people begin liking your books, you grow a whole third life and this is your public life. This is the things that are not writing but are the things that you wouldn't do if you weren't a professional writer. And uh, that's a big enough life that it could completely swallow you if you weren't careful. 